Listen only mode. Hello and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Megan Raymond. I'm the Assistant Director of Programs and Sponsorship here at WCET. As we move along, please enter your questions into the question box and we'll save those until the end and then we'll get to your questions. The webcast is being recorded and we'll send you a link to the recording as well as any resources that are shared. If you'd like to follow along on the PowerPoint, you can download it in the handout box. You can also follow the Twitter back channel at hashtag WCET webcast. Today's webcast is titled Combating Financial Aid Fraud. And we'll move through brief introductions. We'll talk about the difference between fraud and academic integrity. Rio Salado will share some stories about how they handled fraud. And then we'll move on to additional financial aid fraud stories and get to your questions. If by chance we don't get to all of your questions today, we'll pull those questions out and share those with the panelists and they'll provide written responses back to you. Today we have a wonderful moderator who is a steering committee member of WCET's. Amanda Babcock is the online programs compliance coordinator at the University of Utah. And at this point, I'd like to pass it over to Amanda. Thank you, Megan. We are very excited to be offering this webcast today. As uh, the WCET steering committee was talking about issues that are relevant to distance education, online education, and making our programs and our services available to students across a wider base, we decided that there was need to have a conversation that clarified what was really at risk for institutions and what some institutions had already experienced and to gather their stories together and share those within a community so that we could increase awareness and that we could increase the number of people that were talking about fraud and financial aid fraud so that when our various parts and components of each institution come together, we have a more informed professional body to help guide the institution as a whole. As such, we have um, decided to start our presentation um, with some of the best examples that we can. And so real quick, I would like our presenters to please go down the list here and briefly introduce themselves and their institution. And I think the first is Keisha Brock. Keisha, it looks like you're on mute. I'm going to go ahead and unmute you here. Go Thank ahead. Thank you. When I tried to unmute it myself, it, it wouldn't unmute. So I appreciate that. <laughs> sure thing. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Keisha Brock. And I am the Vice President of Strategy and Compliance for the Maricopa Community College District. Prior to that, I worked at Rio Salado College. Um, in particular, uh, the reason I'm here is during the, um, our experiences with fraud over the last decade. And I have since been able to take that work with me to the Maricopa Community College District to try and make sure that we have appropriate controls in place to combat fraud for all 10 Maricopa Community Colleges. I'll go ahead and turn it over to the President, Dr. Bustamante. Yes, yes. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. It's great to be with you. I'm Chris Bustamante. I'm the president of Rio Salado College. I've been the president here for uh, over seven years, but have been with the institution for about 13 years. Uh, Rio Salado College is one of the 10 Maricopa Community Colleges uh, serving the Phoenix uh, metro region. Um, Rio Salado is the largest of the 10 colleges serving 50, over 55,000 students as a single uh, institution. We were founded in 1978 as a college without walls, um, always serving students at a distance. And then when at the advent of the internet, uh, it made sense <coughs> for um, the college to uh, uh, go ahead and try online learning to see how that worked. And so we were an early adopter of online learning. And as, as a result of that, today we have uh, well over 27,000 students online 
and that represents about half of our students. The others are in sector partnerships. And some of the uniqueness of our online program is that we offer uh, over 48 start, about 48 start dates a year for uh, most of our students, and we guarantee that we never cancel classes. Uh, there are over 600 classes available online. And we have a lot of supplemental learners as a result of our bank and transfer um, credit abilities. So uh, lots more to talk about when we get to uh, uh, some other opportunities, but I'll stop there. Thank you. Jason? Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, depending on where you fall within the time zones. Um, my name is Tyson Heath. I am the manager of state authorization serving within the Compliance and Accreditation Department at Western Governors University. And I have been um, helping to serve on various projects um, that the WCT Steering Committee um, has been undertaking over the past couple of years, and uh, more importantly, within the past year, serving um, on research for the Steering Committee regarding um, complaints, notification, and disclosures, um, academic integrity, and um, now doing some research into financial aid fraud, which we um, will share later with you in this um, webcast. Hi, and I'm Russ Poulin. I'm the Director of Policy and Analysis with WCET. In that role, I really enjoy uh, working with Amanda and others on, this, on the steering committee in terms of identifying issues of interest to to our membership and then trying to find practical solutions for you. And that's why we have this webcast today. I'll turn it to Bev. Okay. Thank you. I also was experiencing that being able to unmute myself. Okay. My name is Beverly Wade. I am the Director of State Authorization at the University of Pacific in California. This is my first role of working with the steering committee that I'm very excited about. And so um, Tyson and I will present later on what we've uncovered or discovered, I should say, um, surrounding financial aid fraud. Thanks, Beverly. We are very excited to have all of our presenters here. Um, they bring with them a wealth of knowledge. And so let's get moving to our first presenter, Russ Poulin. Hi, thank you. Yeah, and I'm going to give a very brief uh, uh, background just to uh, uh, help us uh, look at some terms and, and set the stage for what we're doing. That when we get into the student identity area uh, and trying to figure out, you know, is, is the student actually the student that there are uh, at least a, a couple areas here that we want to talk about today, but there are several more as well. But we want to focus on that there's confusion between this idea of academic integrity and financial aid fraud, and we wanted to make sure that we correctly set the stage from the beginning about what we're talking about today. So let's go to the, the next slide. I'm going to uh, ferret out that part of this is on the academic integrity uh, that we're talking about, you know, people who, these are really students who are known to you, that they're, they are uh, students that are in your, in your courses, but what they decide to do is that rather than study to, for the test, that they're uh, cheating, and you can see in the, the picture there, they're writing on their hand, or uh, that they they got that uh, app where they could um, print out new uh, new labels for Coke bottles, and then put the uh, answers to the test on the Coke bottles or, or water bottles. You know, all sorts of things that they do, or they get other people to take their tests. And so, uh, this is something where it is not a criminal offense. It's something, but it is something that we take very seriously as that. Uh, academics in terms of trying to figure out what happened, what's happening with that. I'm going to put up some uh, uh, resources uh, that WCT has in this whole academic integrity area and let you know to be watching that we do have another group within the steering committee that is looking to update uh, some of our resources on, on academic integrity. So uh, be looking for that and, and what you can do to uh, combat cheating in a digital world. Let's move to the next one where we're talking about uh, the financial aid fraud. This is criminal activity. This is somebody who's coming in, and what they're doing is that either uh, they're using their, 
their own identity and then trying to do different things or or what they'll often do is that they'll go out and they'll gather several different identities and they have no intention of being a student what they do want to do is that they want to go far enough so that they far enough into the course so that they can collect the financial aid money and then they disappear uh, they're stealing money from other students they're stealing money from the taxpayers and, and we want to be part of, of uh, combating that and, and, and keeping that in check uh, we are not talking about institutional fraud you may have heard of uh, some sort of things where institutions have uh, maybe uh, done some things where uh, trying to get money out of uh, out of students we're not talking about that we're talking about people who are uh, misidentifying themselves to institutions and want and essentially are stealing money. Well, let's go to the the next slide uh, they have there, and then wanted to also bring up, you know, beyond just these uh, student identity things, just some backgrounds that there is this uh, 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 financial aid audit or the uh, audit report that came from the Department of Education's Office of Inspector General. I remember February fourteenth, twenty fourteen, uh, that 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 came out and it had all sorts of recommendations and the Department of Education was supposed to respond to that within I believe 60 or 90 days and they still uh, have not come out with uh, uh, new recommendations on that. In that it, it, it pointed uh, out and, and showed that there was still a lot of opportunity for financial aid uh, fraud especially in distance ed uh, courses and uh, gave some suggestions uh, some of which I thought were a little too much. There are times where they themselves confused the academic integrity and the fraud rules in terms of some of their solutions. And so that report is out there. And one of the things I wanted to point out with the uh, other that's an inside higher ed uh, article with the student aid skirmish is that this all may be coming back to us now because they're now in the last couple of years there's been great concerns by Congress about improper payments that have been made uh, in federal financial aid uh, to uh, students or to or to others, and uh, in in that article they talk about that the number of the amount of improper payments from 2015 to 2016 in just the Pell program went from 562 million to 2.2 billion. It's just in one year, uh, so they're worried about the oversight of the department. Fraud is part of that. There's, uh, the uh, department is supposed to come back with a report about what they're going to do about it, uh, probably in July. So we may be hearing more about this. This may be a very timely seminar. With that, I'm going to turn it back to Amanda. Thank you, Russ. So our next speakers are Dr. Busmonte and uh, Keisha Brock. Um, as they mentioned in their introductions, they were both at Rios Lotto when they had what has become a well-known case of fraud occur. And so without further ado, I will hand it over to them. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak about this topic. Um, I'm going to start with just an introduction to what we discovered in 2009 and then talk about what protocols and assurances we put in place to prevent it at the college level and then how we morphed that into a larger solution to put appropriate controls in place at the district level. So back in 2009, I was in a role at Rio Salado College as the Dean of Student Affairs and we had a very observant part-time employee who noticed multiple paper documents that had been submitted with very similar handwriting and very um, and, and examples of the same demographic information. So for example, it would be a unique student identifier name and social security number, but the same email address or the same phone number and physical address. And fortunately, this employee brought it to the attention of the financial aid director who in turn brought it to the attention of the leadership and we immediately reached out to the Department of Education Office of Inspector General to report what we had discovered and this was you know again in 2009 so they were not as 
really this is when this issue was just really beginning to surface and so they weren't as strapped for resources and they immediately sent out investigators to work side by side with our financial aid department to see if we could indict these individuals. In the end, we worked with them collaboratively and were able to indict 65 defendants um, on charges of financial aid fraud. And ultimately, the way we arrived at a conviction was through mail fraud. We actually had to send the physical check out and were able to then capture the perpetrators through that process. So it was quite the experience. I had no idea when I moved into higher education that I could also live my dream of being Cagney from Cagney and Lacey. So I was, I was thrilled about that opportunity. However, um, you know, again, it's, it's a very difficult thing for an institution to navigate. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about how we navigated it and how Rio Salado College matured and then what we're now doing at the district level. So if you go ahead to the next slide. Russ mentioned this just briefly, but I want to just make sure that there's a clear understanding that there are different types of financial aid fraud that are perpetrated against institutions. The one that I just spoke about was a fraud ring, and that is the one I think that is the most costly and the ones that seemed to have the greatest negative impact on institutions of higher education, in particular those institutions that are low cost with low tuition and that are open access. Um, because that nets a larger return for these fraud ring leaders. Uh, typical fraud rings have a, a leader with recruiters, and the recruiters go out and they recruit straw students or fake students, and they oftentimes, unfortunately, are targeting underrepresented student populations, oftentimes people who do not have a GED, um, and who have are from a lower socioeconomic status, so they have a need for that income. And they sell it as this is your entitlement. You're entitled to these, these funds, and let me help you get them at just a low cost to you. Um, and again, these are the ones that, that net the largest negative impact on the federal entitlement program and on institutions. You then have Pell Runners, and these are really onesie, twosie, small numbers of individuals who move from institution to institution, get their Pell, and then do not necessarily complete um, their pursuit. And they're really just living or going to school to get the money. And those are much harder to catch because there's some subjective um, analysis that you would have to do to even, I mean, you, it really, it's hard to, to objectively identified those individuals. And then lastly, identity theft plays a, a role in this as well. Some fraud rings actually operate on stolen identities, identities of deceased individuals or children or uh, people that are incarcerated. Uh, but generally, uh, you know, you have to handle fraud rings and identity theft just a little bit differently. So go ahead and move on to the next slide. So really, from a 30,000 foot level, there are two issues that when your institution faces this, you need to consider. One is the, the reactive response to fraud. And then the second, where you actually ultimately want to get at and put a program in place, is the prevention. And I would say during our issue in 2009 until about 2011, 2012, we were working in the response mode with our Department of Education partners. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of clarity around how we could leverage the regulations to actually stop money from going out because the role of a financial aid office and a financial aid director is to facilitate um, the release of these Title IV funds to students. We are not or we're never really supposed to be acting as the keepers of the funds. We more facilitate that entitlement so they can go to college and pursue their education. So it really was a shift in paradigm that moved us from response to prevention. And again, that happened around 2011, and this is the time period again where we were starting to see really big instances of this across the nation and at Rio, and the Office of Inspector General's office really became inundated and buried in 
reported cases of fraud. So they were less able to be proactive. And at that point, we decided, you know, we really have to do something um, preventative to stop this from occurring at all. That is right around the time as well that they released, I think it was the 2011 report on fraud, and they gave some clear direction that they did want institutions to take a much more proactive role in prevention. So again, in order to catch the perpetrators, you have to allow financial aid to process and money to go out. And they shifted now that, you know, we don't want that to occur. We want you just to put controls in place up front to prevent it. So if you move forward to the next slide. So for us, figuring out how to prevent it was a challenge. And mostly because we were trying to balance two competing interests. One is, as an institution, as Chris, Chris mentioned in the um, introduction, that really prides itself on ease of access and flexibility and a positive student experience, it was very difficult to figure out how can you still promote that ease of entry, open access, uh, and a positive customer service experience while implementing things that could be perceived as, as barriers to that. So uh, that was sort of something that we had to grapple with as an institution because, again, our goal was to provide access and get students in quickly um, and efficiently and in a positive way without um, scaring them away with too many pieces or steps of bureaucracy. So we, we struggled with that. Um, and go ahead and move to the next slide. And so what we decided to do is work with the student life cycle. Um, so every control we put in place, we put in place to help promote student success. And we felt that that would definitely help eliminate at least the larger uh, um, fraud rings. It would, it would put more barriers in place that would ultimately help the legitimate student but that would prevent the student who's coming for funds to maybe not come in. So uh, what we did is we took it, we took this entire thing out of financial aid and shifted our paradigm and said, this is a college issue. And as such, we're going to use all college resources. So we moved a lot of these um, barriers or obstacles up front in the admissions process. And we also leveraged institutional research and other entities to try and stop these perpetrators before they even got in through the front door. So we, first and foremost, in the admission uh, requirements, made sure that we had a much better understanding of what the intent of the student was. And if you begin engaging them in advising or career counseling up front, you know, a, a potential ringleader uh, is going to have a difficult time making 60 calls on behalf of the straw students uh, talking about what their career interest is and employment interest. It just puts more of an obstacle in place. But if you are a student truly interested in pursuing a degree, having that advising session is, is beneficial. We also uh, began requiring in 2011, early 2012, that all students validate ID prior to enrolling and that they send us proof from um, an official body of their prior education. So they had to actually send in a high school diploma from the high school they graduated from, or if they had previously attended college, the college transcript, or if they had a GED, proof that they had earned a GED. And this was probably the most effective barrier because, again, the fraud ringleaders oftentimes preyed on underserved populations. and as such, they did not readily have this information at their fingertips. I think our efforts really accelerated when we began to use data. We uh, worked with partners at University of Phoenix and other institutions to figure out how we could flag suspicious data points. And an example of suspicious data points would be, again, multiple student IDs with the same email or the same address. And I remember in 2011 when we first started doing this, we had an address uh, in Georgia that had 60 plus people living in it. And I went on to Google Maps and it was a three bedroom house. 
So, uh, you know, that's a good indicator that there's some suspicious activity going on there. So, we started a fraud squad as a part of all of this as well, and it was a team of individuals that we moved out of student affairs that really just addressed the inquiries from people who we had flagged. And again, we wanted to be very careful. You don't want to flag somebody who really is a legitimate student. So we used multiple data points prior to flagging them. They had to have more than one suspicious element before we would put them in this flag list and then ask them for additional validation of their intent, their identity, and their prior education. Go ahead and move forward. So a timeline of how we moved this from a college um, effort to a district effort is demonstrated or outlined here. And again, between 20, uh, 2008 and 2011, we were working hand in hand with the Office of Inspector General and we were in that response mode, not in necessarily in the pre uh, proactive mode. In July 2011, the leadership made the strategic decision to implement proactive strategies, to, to stop utilizing our resources um, to allow this money to go out with hopes of conviction, but to stop them from coming in altogether. Um, we did a soft launch of those initiatives I talked about the 20 and December of 2011, uh, 2011 and August of 2012. And then we fully imp implemented in 2012 the identity authentication process, followed closely by the prior ed authentication process. And as soon as we implemented those items, the fraud rings moved to other Maricopa colleges. And immediately, the other colleges, by fall of 2014, implemented those same protocols that Rio had put in place. We also, as a system, conducted an internal audit using our inter Office of Internal Audit and came up with recommendations to be proactive in addressing this issue. And one of those recommendations is that we establish a system entity that would um, respond to cases of financial aid fraud, of identity theft, and would put proactive measures in place to support the colleges in order to prevent um, cases of fraud. And that area currently is in the Office of Compliance, uh, which I oversee for the Maricopa Community College system. So we've had um, a pretty, I think, effective, we have effective measures in place. Um, the trick also, if, as, you're, as a public entity, is you want to make sure that, you know, most of your resources you're spending on student success. And so we try to limit the amount of human resources we apply to these efforts because we want our human resources to be applied to advising and instruction, et cetera. So we are really trying to figure out ways to leverage predictive analytics and to maybe get a little bit more sophisticated with how we flag students and how we do the initial follow-up with those flagged individuals and, and then move on. So I think, is, I think that's the last slide for me. Let me see. Nope, one more, uh, which I just talked about. So again, I would say that you know, what we're really trying to do as an institution at this point is promote vigilance. One other thing I did want to mention is the, the importance of training staff on identification of red flags, but making sure that you balance that with the fact that they're there to serve students. Because we did, in the early period of time, see some impact on morale as individuals were trying to get into the system and they would just very clearly say, we just want the money. Um, so it's, it's important to train your staff and as soon as possible to establish a team that can work with perpetrators so that you keep your support student affairs team separate from that. Um, and that's it. With that, I think I'll turn it over to Dr. Bustamante so he can give you uh, he was he was here during that time as well, and he can give you some insight from the lens of a president. Yes, yes, um, we uh, had quite uh, the time as uh, Keisha indicated relative to um, fraud. We knew that fraud was everywhere, but little, little did we know that it would come back, uh, you know, to really haunt us in striking our online program. 
Um, and so that happened as early as uh, 2006, which preceded me as president. It was Dr. Linda Thor at the time that experienced it at uh, first. They gave her little time uh, to respond when the U.S. Attorney's Office decided to hold a press conference announcing uh, that they were um, had uh, successfully uh, convicted um, some uh, perpetrators or participants in financial aid fraud with Rio Salado College. So I think they gave her a little uh, less than a few hours to prepare um, to go to the press conference. And so, you know, from a press perspective, it was really important for us to get the word out that it was our employees that found uh, the discrepancies and reported them. And that uh, it was important for us to be transparent to the community and to uh, our board and our chancellor, and as well as originally reporting them uh, uh, to USDOE in terms of um, those uh, employees early on who were adept at um, really screening um, these applications and, and finding, um, you know, the, the, what had occurred. So uh, it was really important that we work with the Inspector General as well and cooperate with USDOE. Um, I, I would advise you to do that. We were always worry, worried about our financial aid status, what it would do uh, to our status while we were going through it all. Um, it went as far as having, you know, our Associate Dean having to testify in court um, against these perpetrators as well. And so um, we worked, uh, as uh, Keisha explained, hand in hand and for, uh, with the Inspector General's Office and for a president. That was very uh, nerve wracking because, uh, you know, we should be more focused on doing what we need to do for our students rather than fighting fraud. That was more the Inspector General's responsibility, but it was really uh, important that we assist in uh, that. Little did we know that it would go to those great extents. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is that front gate strategy that Keisha talked about was really key. It took us uh, a longer period of time to be proactive, and so I would encourage you all to be more proactive um, to have that front gate strategy, as she explained, relative to um, requiring a lot at the, at the uh, front of the process. Because once they get to financial aid, it's very, very uh, difficult. Um, to deal with all of those rules and you know what what you um, have the opportunity to deny them of etc so that was important the training's important identifying compliance office or that fraud squad um, uh, to help out to identify um, uh, these elements and to become experts at it and then uh, training faculty even um, to um, see it to know it and to report it was really important for us too um, the uh, even further prosecutions caused more press uh, to be written about online education in, in general, and then Rio's name was associated with those articles and even the Inspector General's report. So it was really important for our press people to um, contact uh, the reporters and educate them about uh, what our role in uh, that whole process was to be able to get our story out as well. So we didn't choose to fan the fire, but we did make sure that our story um, was told rather relative to us being transparent that our people actually found the fraud and that we were cooperating um, with the authorities. I was concerned about the reputation of the college, um, but understood that our, our best path um, to retaining our reputation was that cooperation with the authorities as well as that transparency with everyone, everyone involved. I can't tell you enough how important it was to keep our board informed went into executive session at least a couple of times with them. They were concerned about uh, the reports that they were hearing and seeing as well. Um, and then um, ensuring there were no surprises to our, uh, with our chancellor. Um, once these practices, the processes and practices that um, Keisha carefully uh, told you about, once they're firmly in and place and consistently applied, you're going to see a big difference in your ability to minimize fraud. So in summary, from a presidential perspective, providing urgency to the issue at hand, uh, being transparent, uh, cooperating with USDOE and the Inspector General's Office, managing the communications to our leadership, and doing what we could to minimize the media coverage by just answering their questions and not making the problem worse, and by sharing best practices uh, for the good of online education as we're doing today. 
um, and having that dedicated compliance team in place that we continue to have today that has expanded even beyond this issue but many of the other regulations that we have to follow with uh, our accreditors and regulators is really really important it has uh, set us on a better course so we hope what we share to do, uh, with you today has been helpful thank you thank you so much dr busamonte we do have two questions for the rio Salado folks the first one is a two-part question uh, have you been able to get reports back from the OIG or elsewhere that your conduct offices could then use to adjudicate through the student conduct process? Any suggestions for getting clear information back to know who was likely aware of the fraud being committed and who may have been just a victim? That's a really good question. And at the system level now, we do when a, an indictment is made or um, a perpetrator is uh, convicted, Eventually, we have in two instances received a list back in some of the larger cases of individuals who they felt were innocent in the case. And when I mentioned earlier the responsive piece of this, we've had to establish a protocol to do um, file victim care, for lack of a better term, but to make sure that things in that student record or that straw student record are corrected to reflect that they were a victim of the fraud ring and not actually a perpetrator. Um, but again, of all the cases that have hit Maricopa, I believe there are only two instances that we've received that list back which clearly delineated who they felt um, were victims. Um, unfortunately, if someone comes forward now and they were a victim, uh, and associated with one of these rings, they would have to go through our additional protocols we've put in place to validate that they were a victim of identity theft. And so an example of that would be we ask them to get a notarized uh, letter, they have to have filed a police report, they send all of that to us. So if the OIG hasn't cleared them, we then have our own process in place. Uh, we work with public safety and others to see if we can uh, determine if they were acting involved. In terms of the adjudication process, we do use that, um, in particular in cases of um, where a student or a straw student may have submitted fraudulent documents. Uh, but again, most straw students, most of these perpetrators uh, are not actual students, and as soon as they get the money, they leave and they do not attempt to come back. So for most instances, we have not had to rely upon the adjudication process. Great. And the second question was, what do you use to validate identity on the incoming? Uh, so we, they have to send in a state-issued or um, driver's license or identification and we have uh, an online system in our online admissions tool now uh, with a third party that validates. They can take a picture of that and it validates using a couple of different data points that at least the ID matches the personally identifiable information provided. That is not a foolproof tool, of course. And so if then during the data analysis piece, we were to note that that person was also associated with a series of uh, other accounts that used a similar email address or physical address, they would be flagged and we would do some initial or some additional investigation. I know that some institutions are determining if they can use uh, a partnership with the local uh, Depart uh, Department of Motor Vehicles or Social Security Administration to do some additional checks but we have not been able to implement those protocols at this time. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, what a great case study from Rio Salado. Uh, we do have two more questions, but uh, in the interest of making sure that Tyson and Beverly have enough time to go through their research, um, I will hang on to those, and then if we have time at the end, swing back to them. Otherwise, we will make sure that they get answered for you after the end of the webcast. Uh, and with that, we will turn this over to Tyson Wade or Tyson Heath and Beverly Wade, who we tasked with sorry guys, who we tasked with collecting other potential stories of fraud to see if we could find any commonalities or best practices that were shared among uh, institutions that had been victims of fraud. And with that, I will turn it over to you guys.
Okay, thank you. This is Beverly Wade. Um, our research, just to give some context, the reason why as state authorization professionals that we are especially interested in financial aid is that the financial aid, um, our index score impacts institutions membership into the state authorization reciprocity agreement, SARA. So we need to keep our scores within certain levels so that institutions can um, robustly participate in that agreement. And so we use um, certain sources to gather the information and one of the some of the resources that we used was the 2014 Inspector General Financial Aid Audit Report um, pre Preventing Abuse in Federal Student Aid Community College Practices by American Association of Community Colleges and Proposed Safeguards Against Financial Aid Fraud by w WCET. So what happened was that as online education became more pre prevalent, that then prioritized the need for increased awareness of Title IV fraud. And we saw an increase between 2009 and 2012 of 82% in which people were then using um, fraud as a way to gain more money. So the impact of that is that there's less access to aid for legitimate students and potential effects potentially affect an institution's cohort default rate. Next slide, please. So, um, as was previously stated, um, there's different scenarios. So, the single individual using their own identity to obtain financial aid funds without intending to matriculate. In this case, perhaps they took a course a semester or so before they saw that it was easier, that the monies that they were then getting back, because not all um, monies need to be used for tuition, that may have given them a rise in their interest in using that because they saw it as an easier way to get the money that they needed to just do whatever it is that they prioritized at that time. Um, an individual who steals others' identity or colludes with others to inundate the school with multiple fraud attempts and the sophisticated fraud ring. But at the end of the day, while all of those things are important, the greatest concern is the um, organized fraud rings. Tyson? Great. So um, as um, Beverly just alluded to, um, and as well as uh, Keisha earlier in her presentation, there are multiple different uh, scenarios that can take place um, for these um, perpetrators to commit fraud. Um, we felt it was important to, um, to give a couple of examples of recent fraud cases that have been published by the OIG as well as local news media outlets because it, it shows that you know this this began in 2009 but it is still an ongoing problem and as distant education continues to evolve it will continue um, to be a problem as you know perpetrators begin to get smarter and smarter and institutions can put up safeguard and safeguards but there will always be bad actors out there um, looking for the opportunities to, to cash in on and, and take advantage of institutions as well as um, the identities of the individuals that they are um, stealing the information from. So uh, one of the most recent cases um, that came out was from Andrea Williams and this was a case um, in the state of Georgia. It was determined that she was doing most of this damage during the time period of January 2013 through November 2015. And during that time period, she received over $200,000 in financial aid out of over the 500,000 that she was awarded. So, you know, most of that was going to the institution and then her kickback that she was receiving was uh, just over $200,000. Um, how she was getting this information is 
she worked at a healthcare organization where she had access to um, the patient database where she was able to get personal information, identifying information, where then she could um, apply to um, institutions to get in and then apply for the funds. So she was um, stealing multiple people's identity. Ultimately, um, late last year, she was sent sentenced to just over six years in prison in order to pay um, $277,000. So essentially pay back everything um, that she received as well as um, she was forced to pay back um, for breaking you know, different FERPA laws um, within her own organization. And then the second case to just briefly highlight was um, Bobby Lowe. He was 66 years old, uh, living in Louisiana. He conspired with student applicants to produce fraudulent high school transcripts and diplomas, as well as GED and certificates. Ultimately, the scheme was to obtain financial aid fraud um, by getting students in the door into a local community college in New Orleans by providing the documentation that was needed for um, admission. And so currently, he has not been sentenced yet, but he is facing uh, five years in prison and a fine. Next slide, Megan. So those were just two of the cases that we wanted to highlight because they were more recent. On the OIG's website, there are you know handfuls and handfuls of other examples and cases um, like the two that I just talked about. Here are some links to some more of the recent ones that um, are, are currently in the media at this time. Next slide. Great. So now Beverly's going to talk about some of the um, interviews that she conducted over the past couple of months, um, talking with individuals who were at institutions that um, felt um, the, this issue of fraud. All right. And so what, what um, were the point during the interviews is that the identification of fraud is difficult to ascertain in certain circumstances. And it also became um, quickly evident that when students are getting a lot of monies back, um, if the tuition is not very high, it means that community colleges are more susceptible to being taken advantage of. A lot of private institutions where I am at a private institution may not experience as much breach as other institutions because there's not a lot of return that then the student or the perpetrators will then um, gain. Another innovation or an innovation that happened at the federal level that um, hopefully will help to alleviate some of the financial aid fraud was wedding FAFSA to the IRS data retrieval tool. And so that way um, a student can then just put in their social security number, they can um, link all of the, the forms and the financial component will then be easier to gain. The FAFSA application should be easier to complete. And um, the verification of who they say they are hopefully will then also be um, complete as well because that, that retrieval tool, it is very hard to, to breach that to then commit fraud. Um, and then the return of the Title IV um, funds, if it is misappropriated, is a big component to holding institutions responsible. So if institutions are doing um, the recommended components that, whether it's the Office of um, Inspector General and or DOE, through gainful employment and all of these other mechanisms are saying to do, then financial aid fraud should be reduced and that you should be able to identify um, the mismanagement that is occurring at institutions and then ways to alleviate that mismanagement. Next slide. So one of the institutions that I talked to that I really enjoyed our conversation, um, they had, just like Rio Salado, been involved in 
prosecuting some of the financial aid frauds that have occurred through the years. So one of the things that they did to alleviate things was that they created a red, red flag process. And what that what they did was they um, they took the financial aid professionals as well as um, advising professionals and stakeholders and they have meetings on at least a monthly basis where they are going over scenarios case by case to ensure that what what is being bubbled up is being addressed so sometimes um, Earlier, Keisha was talking about how sometimes there are several people that give the same address or same email address, phone numbers, those demographic information. What this institution does is that they make sure that it is treated by case-by-case -case, um, scenario because you may have some first generation in there and it may be multiple people in the same household that is applying and they want to make sure that they are not ascribing um, activities to them that is just honest human error. So they will then ask them to submit additional documentation. Sometimes they may ask them to come in. And from a distance education component, since you may have students that are residing outside of the state or they may not be within close proximity to your institution, you may need to partner with another institution for um, the individual or individuals to take their additional documentation to that institution so that they can prove they are who they say they are or that they have those documentations in place. You may want to utilize Skype, just any kind of things that will then help with the distance, especially as you speak to the distance education component of someone not being within close proximity. Um, and the most important lesson that um, was garnered from, from this entire process was that facts are stranger than fiction. And so not to rush to judgment, making rash decisions, but really to give the benefit of the doubt because there's a lot of human error that occurs and you just want to make sure that you are not misidentifying behaviors that can easily be resolved with just having a conversation before you turn anything in as fraud and escalate it to the inspector general. Next slide. So, um, as Keisha said, some of the potential red flags are students with large financial aid refunds um, for disbursements. Unfortunately, sometimes that leaves community colleges um, as more vulnerable than some other institutions. Um, students who have attended several other colleges and students who have a large student loan balance but who have not completed a degree and probably aren't very close to completing one either. Okay, next slide, Tyson. Great. So as Amanda alluded to earlier, um, the steering committee wanted uh, research done surrounding financial aid fraud, kind of looking at what current best practices are out there. And to be able to have all this information in one uh, place that can be disseminated across to um, the consortium so that everybody has access to it without having to really do most of all that research and pull all these articles together. So um, as Beverly said, we, we looked at you know multiple different sources and um, consolidated all of what they were saying is best practice um, into kind of these six key areas. Um, Dr. Bustamante mentioned these earlier as well as Keisha, but just a couple of um, things to think about to just acknowledge the issue. Um, it would be very naive to assume that an institution could not be affected by fraud. And just remember that fraud can occur in many forms as discussed by Beverly and Keisha. Um, as Dr. Bustamante said, follow the Department of Education's guidelines. Um, most institutions have implemented and practiced the department's anti-fraud um, regulations. However, um, there are some institutions that still haven't, and the DOE has um, come out basically saying that 
if institutions do follow some of these regulations regarding fraud, um, they can limit their damages. So by taking an example of using the unusual remote um, enrollment history procedures. Um, next, invest in fraud detection technologies. Um, catching fraud can take a lot of staff time, but if an institution can invest in different technologies, it can help simplify the process of detection um, by tracking addresses, as uh, mentioned earlier, looking at zip codes, looking at IP address. So um, using technology um, can greatly um, help. Um, verifying the applicant's identity. Um, does the institution have a thorough verification of student identification for all financial aid applicants? Um, Keisha talked about what Rio Salado and Maricopa um, colleges were doing. Um, the WCT Steering Committee has put out information before in blogs regarding um, student verification, and so we would say check out um, those resources. Um, have, have staff keep their eyes and ears open. Um, you know, best practice when it comes to inbound phone calls to detect inconsistent voices, strange hesitation, background chatter, chatter, or other clues that might indicate that you could be speaking with a fake student or um, dealing with that sophisticated ring um, leader um, in the fraud ring leader um, call center. And then can the student verify all their personal information? And then finally, have a, a more fraud centralized related work. Have one point person at an institution who is looking at fraud strategy that can communicate this information to stakeholders across the institution, um, to have students get engaged, to make them sensi um, sensitize them about the potential of student aid fraud. Make sure your faculty is engaged. Um, they can be essential in preventing, preventing student aid fraud. Um, and then finally, within the Student Financial Aid Office, um, different practices um, that Russ had mentioned before, of uh, um, disperse student aid fraud and two or more payments within each period of enrollment. So with that, I want to move forward um, to the one more slide, which is just some resources. Please check out these resources um, when you have time. It, it, goes further into deep what we cover. I know we're pushing against the clock, so I will um, finish there. Okay, thank you all. Amanda, do you want to address some remaining questions? You might be. Right, right. There you go. There. <laughs> Okay, uh, yes, we did have um, two remaining questions for, let's see, the Rio Salado group. Um, the first one was, what is the size of the fraud investigation team at the institutions? Uh, currently, for the entire district, the fraud investigation team, which also does identity theft investigation, has a director, assistant director, who oversees it, and then two investigators and an analyst and then a few part-time people that do document intake. And Great. that's for the all 10 colleges. Perfect. Uh, and then the second question is, do schools recommend or have a process in place to collect IP addresses for online students? If so, what does that process look like? IP, address, IP addresses uh, are one of the indicators we use with the analytics. So when they go on to admit or enroll using our online tool, we can compare IP addresses. But again, I think it's important to make sure you use more than one ident identifier. Uh, oftentimes people in the same community will use the same computer in a uh, library or some other location. So it's important to use that and another identifier. Another piece that's um, interesting to use when you look at IP is not just the same IP address, but the time between applicants using that address. If it's, you know, every two or three minutes a new admission application is submitted from that, then it's likely someone is trying to penetrate your controls. Thank you. And then our last question could actually be open to any of our panelists. 
Uh, are there any vendors or technology providers that any of the presenters would recommend to help prevent fraud? I'm not aware of any. Um, maybe a couple of us should start our own company and figure out what we can come up with. <laughs> I'm actually not aware. I mean, I know there are vendors that help with data analytics, but I don't think any of the focus in higher ed has been on this. It's been on other sorts of initiatives supporting student success. Great. Thank you. Great. Well, I'm going to take it from here, Amanda. Thank you very much for your adept moderating and wonderful question handling. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our audience. Wonderful questions and engagement. Do join us for our next webcast, eLearning Consortia Stories from the Past and Looking to the Future on August 17th. And that information is posted on the WCET website. Again, this webcast was recorded and you will be able to access the link uh, via the link. And we'll also send you an email as soon as the archive recording is posted on our YouTube website. Mark your calendars for October 25th to the 27th in Denver, Colorado for the WCET annual meeting, and that is open to members and non-members of the organization. We're busily putting the program together, and I know it's one you're not going to want to miss. Thank you to our supporting members, as well as WCET annual sponsors that underwrite our programs and events here at WCET. So with that, I'll go ahead and conclude today's webcast. And again, thank you to our wonderful panelists. Thank you.